Wilson. Wilson. <laughs> How many times do I have to tell you not to say hello on the telephone? Announce yourself, officially. This is HQ, number one company, B platoon, Warmington on Sea, Home Guard. And you are Platoon Sergeant Wilson. Yes, right. right. Uh, this is uh, HQ, number one platoon, B company, Warmington on Sea, Home Guard. And this is uh, Platoon Sergeant Wilson speaking, yes. Oh, hello. <laughs> Nice to hear from you again. It has been such a long time, hasn't it? He defies description, I think, really, John. Um, all one ever saw was, you know, to use a hackneyed phrase, the tip of the iceberg. I think we only saw what John wanted all of us to see, including Joan, I think. Would you all mind falling? <laughs> <laughs> Just relax, please. Just as quickly as you can. Thank you so much. In three nice, neat lines. <laughs> That'll be absolutely lovely. Thank you so much. I think he was perfectly cast as Sergeant Wilson. I don't think anybody else could have done that. Anybody in the world could have played Sergeant Wilson like John did. It was John. Oh, yes, that's awfully good. It's all... Oh, yes, it's all sparkly. You know, it's just like fairyland, sir. The thing about John is he had an enormous sense of fun. Uh, I think people perceive him as a sort of authority figure, but actually he was very playful and very naughty. Wilson. Wilson, come Thank you so much. Wilson. Most kind of you. Thank you very much. Wilson. I'm sorry. <laughs> John Le Measurer was best known for his portrayal of Sergeant Wilson in Dad's Army. He grew up in the prosperous town of Bury St Edmunds in Suffolk. After a public school education, John was expected to follow in his father and grandfather's footsteps and pursue a career in law. He was brought up in a sort of Betchamesque countryside, you know. When he was very young, he was out with his nanny and he saw a crowd of people coming out of the local theatre. And they were very um, flamboyant and dressed up and the women wore lots, far too much makeup, but he just thought they were were gorgeous and he said to Nanny who are those people Nanny and she said those are theatricals Master John and you must have nothing whatever to do with them ever but John never forgot the theatricals and when he was 21 he abandoned law and finally pursued his dream to become an actor after a brief stint at drama school his career began in repertory theatre he was divine, absolutely stunning. You know, he had blue-black hair, beautiful dark eyes, incredibly good-looking. People pined away for him. I mean, there was one girl who got, really got quite thin. I'm sure she was taken off to be a nun instead of her be staying there with what John was about. <laughs> he, I think he possibly knew that he had this great charm. Well, John was a ladies' man. They all adored him. I mean, he was very attractive to ladies. You either got it or you ain't. And John Le Measure had it. He was, you see, he, 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 the first time he met a woman, he would search out something to say to her. Thank you so much for showing us the way. Well, that's quite all right, sir. I must say that uh, that uniform uh, really does suit you awfully well. Oh, thank you, sir. <laughs> thank I, you, I think it's the belt, the belt, that little belt you're wearing. Yes, it makes your, <laughs> it makes your waist look absolutely tiny. And, of course, the woman felt marvellous. And he'd go all over her like that and picking out things to compliment her on. What's the Christian name? Marcia. Marcia. What a pretty name. <laughs> do you really think so? Yes, I do. It's one of my favourites. I really do love that name. <laughs> Just before the Second World War, John began working with theatre director June Melville. They fell in love and were married in 1939. She looked fantastic you know she had some wrapped in mink and as the second or third or fourth gin and tonic went down it began to melt away a little bit and uh, the hat would slip to one side and you would just watch this beauty disintegrating before your eyes june's drinking worried john but their marriage and john's career in rep were interrupted in 1940 when he was called up to serve as an officer in the royal armored corps the very idea of John Le Measurer being in charge of anybody, let alone an army, 
it just the idea of it just makes me laugh because he was so impractical and, so, and, and such a ditherer. I think he crashed a tank once on the Khyber Pass. He wasn't awfully good at, um, at driving tanks and things like that, made a bit of a muck up. By the end of the war, June's alcoholism had destroyed the marriage, and in 1947 he met actress and comedienne Hattie Jakes. Hattie was like June. She was larger than life. She was larger than life physically as well as every, in every other way. And in those days she was, she was very beautiful and sort of Juno-esque. And she was a star. She had the most amazing personality and sort of radiance about her and energy. And people just... Loved her. She brought a lot of humour into his life too, which he needed at that time. I think he was going, he'd been through a rotten time with June. Had he proposed? She said he would never really have got around to it otherwise. My theory is that Hat fell in love with John Lemage because John Lemage and Robin, her brother, were very alike. I mean, they were vague like you cannot believe, but vague because it suited them, I am sure. And they were both very keen on jazz, and they used to go to little cellars they liked in Soho with very good jazz, you know. And you wouldn't see them. I mean, I mean I'm talking about for days. Poor old Hat, who's having a dinner party, and John would turn up two days later, and she'd say, where have you been? And he said, oh, Oh, darling, I'm so sorry, but very good jazz. And she said, but it's two days later. Time goes so quickly when you can't see daylight. Not a stone's throw from here is Ronnie Scott's. And he was there two or three nights a week. He loved it. He'd just sit there, cigarette, and nothing comes out. And that's how John used to smoke. And if he had a gin in one hand and a fag in the other, and he'd sit in Ronnie Scott's, that was heaven for him. I never once in all the years I knew him saw John drunk. But on the other hand, I very seldom saw him at any time of day without a drink in his hand. I can remember Hattie saying to him, when he, came into the room with the uh, gin and tonic in his hand at something like 10 o'clock in the morning. Darling, don't drink a little early for that kind of thing, you know. John sort of floated above marriage like a flying saucer, really. But, you know, they did adore each other. He lived in a dream world, which is very nice. I once met him to go to opera in November, and we meeting the local pub, of course. And John came in and he said, do you know, darling, is it very cold for this time of year? And I said, well, no, darling, not really, but you are wearing tropical suiting. He said, oh, yes, I see, yes, yes, I see, I understand, yes. What he understood, I don't know, but... Uh... Hello, David, how are you? Despite his vagueness, by the late 50s, John had achieved his ambition to break into British films. Did you say marry? He was also working sure. regularly in television, most notably Hancock's Half Hour. He generally played the stiff upper-lipped Englishman in a suit. May I see that list? If you please. John worked constantly all the time. Every time the Bolting brothers made a film, if John was available, they'd have him in it. They'd, they'd even write a part for him to have him in the, in the, in the show, in the, in the, in the film. So he was in constant demand, and it was never very demanding on him. And I think he was basically quite lazy as an actor. His, his advice to young actors, you know, always give the same performance, and if possible, try to wear the same suit. <laughs> it's all right, Parker, it's all right. I've written one of these things before, you know. Oh, yes, of course, sir. The cabaret, wasn't it, sir? The blues, or was it the Uzzah, sir? Metropolitan Police, you must know. As some critics said when he died, there was always a shining Le Measure moment in a film where John was recognised. John and Hattie had two sons and had been married for ten years when she fell in love with a younger man. She told John, she said, John, you know, I'm terribly sorry, but... Uh, oh, okay. And they all lived in the same house. 
he just carried on his own sweet way, had a few drinks and was, didn't make a big fuss. Most men would have just gone straight off to a hotel or something. No, but uh, I don't think that occurred to him. I mean, the idea of looking for a flat, John couldn't do that. He wouldn't know where to go. His sadness was, was really overwhelming at times. His heart was broken, really broken by Hattie. He really loved her. He must have been hurt so much, but he never showed. It was the old, it was the thing that they were, I suppose, taught at that time, that, you know, an Englishman never shows his emotions. That's, that's how John was, he never showed emotion. That same year, on November the 10th... John and Hattie's breakup was not public knowledge when This Is Your Life featured Hattie. Her new lover watched from the wings. So there's never a dull moment with Hattie, in fact? No, no, there isn't really. I would like, um, I would like to say that I, uh, I am eternally grateful to the way she uh, runs the home, looks after the children, looks after me. The home comes first, really, I think I'm right in saying. <laughs> uh, but uh, I think for somebody who is so busy all the time and so much in the public eye all the time, to do all these things is very difficult and a jolly neat trick. Thank you, John de Messier. <laughs> Luckily, I was there like a sort of, should I say, cushion um, to, to break the fall. And we became great friends. And it was, oh, 18 months before anything deepened between John and I. But in the meantime, I was the person who there, there, and tut tutted to him. Joan was 20 years younger than John. She'd previously been married to the actor Mark Eden, and together they had a son, David. They were still close, and it was through Joan that Mark and John became friends. John was just this lovely gentleman, and I, I felt for him eventually. It certainly wasn't love at first sight. But in 1966, John and Joan were married. When John proposed to me, I didn't know I was being proposed to. It was in a restaurant called Grumbles, which was very, uh, very accurate. And he said, I don't know what I'm going to do. I, I don't suppose you'd take me on for a start. And I didn't realize that was a proposal of marriage until quite a long time afterwards. They were a strange couple in that sense that, uh, you know, she always wanted to have a house full of people. John, yes, liked perhaps me coming down or, or you know, a chum, but house full of people, he, he, couldn't, he couldn't cope with that. That's why he used to slope off to the pub. Uh, but for some reason, it, it worked. They had homes in Ramsgate and London. Mark was a regular visitor, and they were all close friends. John's television and film career continued to flourish. Excuse me, <clears throat> I'm looking for a, a Janice Goodbody. How do you do? <laughs> Your pardon? Well, that's me, I'm Janice Goodbody. Oh. Limited. Not bad. Not bad at all. You know, you make an excellent butler, but a very poor forger. Everything he played was the same. And as I said, nothing wrong with that. That's what he was booked for. That's what film directors want him for. You have the cart before the camel, Mr. Casimir. According to my figures, you owe the sum of 7,322 pounds, eight shillings and tuppence. Look, uh, you are the representative of the People's Republic, aren't you? Certainly not. I'm the representative of the British government, the Department of Inland Revenue. Taxation, Mr. Casimir. When I married John, he just turned his life over to me. His bank account was sort of my responsibility. He was a man who was totally without greed or malice or jealousy. He hadn't got those emotions in him. Isn't it funny? He would play people that are in positions of some sort of, you know, tin pot power, uh, like tax inspector or something like that, you know. And, uh, but um, he, he's, he was hopeless. I think Joni was out and he was hungry and he made himself a 
boil in the bag dumpling, you know, stew, and he put it in the oven. Right, it's in a plastic bag, and we came home, and this black thing was hanging through the grates. <laughs> Any subjects? Mm. Really? Yes. Mm. <laughs> you know a lot of what? subjects. You know a lot of subjects. <laughs> yes, I do. Well. Do one of those confident ones in a posh voice. Ah, yeah, you know? yes, in a posh voice. <laughs> yes, go on. Yes, well, uh... John's angle on humour was very, very subtle, you know. Little things would really tickle him. Because I remember it now. Somebody told me the other day about a fellow who had a racehorse. And uh, he was on pretty good terms, this racehorse, with his jockey. Lovely talker, isn't he? Yes. <laughs> and, Lovely. And he used to have a lot of quite animated conversations together, these two. And the jockey said to the racehorse one day, now look here, unless you win this race tomorrow, <laughs> you'll find yourself on a milk run the following day. Yeah. Interruption by Joe Brown. Oi, yeah? I've just told it, boy. <laughs> oh, see, that's where I heard it. <laughs> I think he found romance a bit sissy. It was too, um, too sort of emotional for him. John's idea of um, speaking his mind was to pat me on the head or to say, I'm more than somewhat fond of you, you know. And that was about it, you know. He never used the word love too much. He said it was uh, an overused word and it shouldn't be banded about. <coughs> You must be ill, Hancock. I better get a doctor. No, I don't need a doctor. John's closest friend was Tony Hancock. And it was Hancock who would test the strength of John's feelings for Joan. Set free the raging fires that are burning inside Don't start that again, for heaven's sake. Hancock, I... Oh, I do hope you're not one of these angry young men. You're gonna like this. It's the same blend that we used to have at home. Yeah. Darjeeling with a, a trace of souchong. John LeMessure and Tony Hancock frequently worked together in feature films and on television. Of course, it's not quite like a home, but, well, it has its compensations. They shared the same humour. They, they were very, very close friends. I, I would count John as almost his best friend. As I understand it, marriage is a matter of give and take. Not all of us are equipped for that sort of thing. Another cup? No, thank you. Six months after John and Joan's wedding, Hancock's second marriage was on the rocks, and he turned to John for help. We had him at home with us for a week, looking after him. He was in a, quite a state. And really, quite out of the blue, I fell in love with him. Within two or three weeks more, we were living together. It was a complete bombshell that I hadn't expected. Marriage to John was a peaceful, calm, unemotional thing. And with Tony, who really could... I mean, we shared another side of my personality. I remember him saying, you know, he's my best friend, and, and I, I, I brought him to my house, and, and, you know, he walked off with my wife, and that's a bit I find really difficult to accept. Tony was his best friend ever, and he didn't have all that many friends, John, not close friends. And again, John behaved in the most extraordinary fashion and understood why I loved him. There was no anger, there was no, you know, how dare he, no huge, great kind of thing. It was all, oh dear, 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 dear. It's, it sounds extraordinary looking back, but I still ran John's life. I still looked after the cleaner and paid her and paid the bills and did all these things. Tony Hancock was an alcoholic, uh, a manic depressive, uh, all the things, you know, a monster when he'd been drinking, violent, all the things that John was not, ever could be. Then there were the violent um, moments when he would really be out of control and, and of course, I, I'd always 
tell John about them. Uh, John was my confidant, he was my friend, and he shared those things. I, I would creep off. I mean, Tony threw me out once or twice, you know. And... I think he said something like, you are bringing down an enormous amount of trouble upon yourself because, you know, you know he's an alcoholic. And she said, yes. He said, and, you know, people who live with alcoholics usually end up either hating them or, or killing them or whatever. But I was steadfastly in love, and John steadfastly loved us both. After a year of living with Tony Hancock and his alcoholism, Joan returned to John. But after six months, she received a phone call from Hancock. And I met him, went to London, met him. And this time I couldn't leave John again, I couldn't do it. But I did continue to have an affair with him. Again, illicitly. I don't know whether John suspected, but it wasn't, I, I didn't tell him. Hancock went to Australia to relaunch his career. Joan promised him that if he stayed sober for 12 months, she'd leave John and marry him. And it was while he was in Australia that he went back on the booze and everything went wrong. Uh, the show didn't work, the producer didn't get on with Tony and all kinds of things went wrong. And we were communicating by post office box. Then there was a post office strike and I wrote every day. I don't know how I did this behind John's back, but I did. I sent letters to him every day and we we phoned when, when it was possible. Um, and uh, he didn't get my letters for a couple of weeks. That was it for Tony. He thought everything had come to an end, including us. So he took the pills. Tony Hancock died on June the 25th, 1968. John took the phone call. And John, oh my God, I just got to tell Joan. Um, so he woke her up and of course, she literally went hysterical. She became hysterical. And dear John couldn't cope and he rang me and I was fast asleep. I said, well, I wonder, would you mind coming over? Um, because I didn't quite know what to do. And he hadn't known that this was going on and of course then it all came out and poor John had this grief-stricken harpy on his hands for a long time. I was completely devastated. I didn't realise at the time, of course, he was going through his own pain because he loved him. He had a double whammy with the two of us. But she recovered and John took her back and, you know, they, they carried on. You could put it two ways. You would either say that John was totally indifferent to everything that was going on around him, or you could say he's a man that cared very deeply and covered it up very successfully. Never once did he ever remonstrate with me about this. I think that really cemented the next, I think, 18, 19 years that we had together. Tony died on the 25th of June and it was the end of that year that this wonderful little gift of Dad's army came into our lives, which was wonderful for John, you know, because everybody in it was a mate and it was like joining a wonderful family. Sergeant! <laughs> Sorry, yes. We're waiting for you to demonstrate your grenade-firing crossbow. My what? <laughs> crossbow! Oh, no, sir, I'm terribly sorry. I really am terribly sorry, sir, but I'm afraid I, I, I left it at home. You left it at home? What on earth's the matter with you? You're in a dream. Are you feeling ill? No, 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 I've got the hat. Well, pull yourself together. John LeMessurier really became so brilliant by accident. I had no idea he was so good, would do the part. In the end, David Croft and I wrote for him and it fitted in beautifully. So he and Arthur were a perfect combination. Wilson, <laughs> Wilson. Uh, what are you doing? I'm so sorry, sir, but uh, I thought as it was such a beautiful day, I thought while you were chatting away over there, 
I take advantage of this glorious sun and try and get myself a little bit of a tan. <laughs> Sometimes when I watch little moments between him and Arthur Lowe, and I can see that John really is laughing. He's really trying to control because Arthur did make him laugh. He loved Arthur's timing. He was a great admirer. And you needn't think you can roll in here 20 minutes late after lunch. Where have you been? Well, I went up to the golf club and had a bite to eat up there. The golf club? Yes. <laughs> Who took you? Well, I'm a member. You're a member since when? Yes, well, you see, when the uh, committee heard about this title thing, they asked me if I would, uh, you know, like to join. <laughs> I've been trying for years to get in there. I believe they're awfully particular. He had no vanity at all. John had none. I think it was his hair. That was his one vanity. And he got the you know, different shampoos, and she used to wash his hair for him. And as long as his hair was OK, that was it. That was all right. By the way, Wilson, mm -hmm. am I hurting you? No, I don't think so, no. I should be. I'm standing on your hair. Ah, it's a, it's a very old one, that, isn't it? But it always makes me laugh. <laughs> Trying to tell you to get your hair cut. Why oh, don't you like it? Mrs. Pike thinks it makes me look rather like Eden. <laughs> Answer the phone, Anthony. <laughs> Three years into Dad's army, John was offered a radically different role as the lead in a Dennis Potter play based on the defection of Kim Philby. It was called Traitor. He was very, very scared of that one. He didn't want to do that one. He knew he could do, you know, some light comedy easily without... And he, it, it was a big challenge for him, you know. I think he was just worried that he wouldn't be able to uh, pull it off. Oh, an exploitation of millions and millions and millions more! Ugh. And he won the BAFTA Award for Best Actor of the Year which was wonderful for him, though he said he, he didn't believe in prizes. Six years later, on a tour of Australia, John collapsed and was flown home. He was diagnosed with liver failure. The prognosis was that he must never drink again. And that was the thing John found harder than anything, was to give up alcohol. And it was the worst thing that he could possibly have ever done. His whole system went into shock because of this, and uh, he became extremely ill. Have you decided who is going to play St George? I should have thought that was obvious. And he wasted away and was haunted and unhappy. And after a year, he said, I've had a good life, and I really am not happy anymore with not being able to drink. And when he started drinking again, you know, um, the colour came back to his face and he got sort of eight more years after that, I think. Never go into the church, Ossian. My grandmother said to me, because God is not fun. But yeah, really playful, great sense of fun. I don't think people, people know that. They see him as being quite a serious character, but really nothing could be further from the truth. It was a period when he, when he wasn't drinking and it was... Um, we were at a BAFTA dinner, he wasn't picking up a prize then, we were at a big table. And John suddenly leant across because he was drinking, you know, had to drink lemonade or whatever. And he said, I think I have fancy a joint, my darling, and produced this enormous joint from his pocket and, um, and, and lit it. Suddenly there were these clouds of blue smoke. <laughs> and people were sort of looking at him thinking, is he? And they went, no, he couldn't, he couldn't be. The smell was unbelievable. It wasn't even that he didn't really care what people thought. I don't think he was even conscious of it. I don't think he even realised that you weren't supposed to be doing this in public, you know? Let's be down to the burning alley. First time. That was great. During the last few years of his life, John played eccentric Englishman. Too many walls, too many blessed walls, you see. All over the estate. I don't, I don't know what the bailiff's thinking of. I keep telling him this is... There are too many walls, you see. As you get a bit older, life often seems disappointing. Or did it seem disappointing to you? Inevitably. John LeMessurier died on November the 15th, 1983. He was 71. Almost the very, very last thing he ever said to me before he went into a coma was, it's all been rather lovely. Not bad. 
He said to me, will you promise me that when I die, you will put in the times, in the obituary column, John the Measurer conked out, because it always made him laugh. Snuffed it and conked out, because he used to hate it when they said he's gone with the angels and he's departed this life. He hated all that. And it had the most amazing impact. It was on all the billboards that night. Um, Dad's Army Star conks out. Tell them I conked out, said Dad's Army Star. You know, John the Measure of Conked out. And it just went, it's gone into famous last words. As somebody said, considering really he was not a star, he was a supporting actor, always. He got, well, the obituaries were just, I mean, they were so huge. I mean, you would have thought that a major star had died because everybody, it's because everybody felt they knew him and loved him. He was a gentleman, a real gentleman. In fact, he was a one-off. That's his epitaph. He was one of the last of the gentleman actors. Well, there it is. I hope you'll have uh, enjoyed some of the stuff. At least it's a bit different. Likes a predictable ending. He's a royal marine, so we've planned a special surprise. You look a little confused. You will, in fact, be up against another star. This one. How do you feel? More confident. Beat the star. Tonight, 6.45, ITV1.